Hello everybody, happy Saturday morning. Here it is gray and rainy and bleh, but we have good news because we are talking more Cab Franc. And we are talking Cab Franc with the winery in Paso Robles who started Cab Franc Day. So a small boutique winery started in 2013 with one wine and you can guess what that wine is, Cabernet Franc. And that is their flagship and they love producing it. And we're going to talk to them right now. So I'm going to bring in Dracena Wines and hopefully we get together here. So we can. And there is Michael. Hello. Hi, everyone. All right. So happy almost Cab Franc Day. It is December 3rd and our favorite holiday is tomorrow. What do we do? <laughs> okay. Turn the volume up. Couldn't hear you well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, are you typing? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's start off with how did Dracena Wines come to start? So we started in 2013. Um, we started with our first vintage of Cab Franc. Um, and made about 75 cases. Um, got a great score in Wine Enthusiast, got a 91 in Wine Enthusiast and sold out in a couple of months. Um, and then from there, we've just continued to grow. So every, uh, every vintage, um, we've gotten 90 plus ratings. Um, we've gotten some, some great scores and gold medals from San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and we've just continued to move our wines through social media, um, through great word of mouth, um, as Paso is uh, so famous for. Um, so we really look forward to kind of continuing to grow that, grow the brand. And so where do you get the Cab Franc from? So our Cab Franc comes from the east side of Paso. We source our Cab Franc from Plummer Vineyard. Um, it's out off of, uh, out of the airport road, off of Welsona. Um, we source all of our Cab Franc fruit from there um, for both our classic Cab Franc and our reserve Cab Franc. And so today we have the 2018 Classic Cat Franc. So can you get, get a little uh, geeky with us and tell us, you know, what is, this is not a 100% Cat Franc. So tell us how it was made from basically vineyard to bottle. Sure, sure. So um, that Cat Franc, um, uh, we picked in the, the normal, normal harvest for that vin particular vineyard is somewhere between the um, first week and the third week of October. Um, that particular vintage happened to be picked, I believe it was the second week of October. Um, came in pretty normal. Um, 2022 was really light. Um, we can talk about that a little later, but 2018, what, you're, uh, what you've got in your glass there, and I've gotten my glass here. Um, so that was uh, normal harvest. Um, we bring all the uh, we bring all the fruit in. Uh, we do separate. We bring in two clones out of that vineyard, so we bring in a clone three twelve and clone one. Um, we keep those clones separated throughout the entire process. Um, so we bring the fruit in. Um, the fruit actually is processed about a mile down the road. So it's starting harvest about four thirty in the morning. Um, Heart, the fruit gets into the winery by about 6.30, um, so it's still nice and cold. I remember that morning um, with the sunrise coming up being about 35 degrees, um, freezing, watching the workers uh, hand harvest all of that fruit. So we hand harvest all of our fruit. Um, bring it into the winery. Uh, we do normal winery stuff, separation of uh, the, the mug, um, so the matter other than grape. So think about things like leaves and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then... We go through a cold soak for about 48 to 72 hours. So uh, we do about 10% whole cluster um, within that, uh, typically within the vineyard. So we'll leave uh, some of the, the grapes on the stems, throw them into the fermentation bins. We use one and a half ton macro bins to do uh, all of our fermentations. Um, we'll then do some adjustments to the wine. So um, to kind of get the chemistry in place, I'm a, I'm a pr pretty big chemistry buff. So my, my education is in chemistry, not only in winemaking from UC Davis, but also um, a food chemistry background. Um, so love the chemistry, love the chemistry of fruit, uh, love the chemistry of grapes, love the chemistry of winemaking. Um, kind of target a, a certain pH, certain um, titratable acidity within that fruit. Um, and then we'll go through, like I said, the 48 to 72 hour cold soak. Um, and then we kind of begin the process of fermentation. Um, so we have a particular yeast that we like to use. 
Um, takes about 10 days to go through fermentation, um, press it off, um, go through a natural malolactic fermentation um, in barrel. Um, and then we just kind of barrel it down, which is kind of where we are in 2022 at the moment. And so what is the blend of this one? Yep. So uh, the, our Cab Franc typically stays in barrel anywhere between um, 16 and 18 months uh, before we begin to consider the process of, of blending that wine out. This particular wine is 90% Cab Franc, uh, both a blend of 312 and Clone 1. Um, it is 5% Cabernet Sauvignon, 3% Malbec, and 2% Petit Verdot. So um, we had a good time uh, blending that wine and uh, sourcing, some, sourcing some additional blending juice to, to make that wine uh, add additional complexity and make that wine fun. And then you also have a reserve Cabernet Franc. So what is the difference between the reserve and this classic? Sure, great question. Um, so our reserve is always 100% Cab Franc and it always comes from Clone One. Um, so we identify the best barrels that we have in place from Clone One. Um, uh, and usually it's really small. We make anywhere from um, 25 to 40 cases of the reserve. So it could be anywhere from, from a partial, from a, a full one barrel to another half a barrel of another. Um, so we essentially um, make that 100% Cab Franc always from Clone One within the vineyard. Um, and then from there, the rest of that clone will go into the classic. So um, it's, like I said, it's uh, what I like to kind of call, uh, what we like to call it is mother nature in a glass. So dirt in a glass. So whatever the vineyard gives us is essentially what we put into that reserve Cab Franc. So we have a question from a, a Karastos. <laughs> and sounds very excited that there is a reserve Claude One Cab Franc. Can they buy it from you? Sure. Um, so actually, the majority of our reserve goes to our wine club. Um, so there's uh, once we get done shipping to the wine club, we typically have maybe anywhere from from five to six cases left and it moves very quick. Um, so the only way we really kind of can guarantee you getting the reserve is to join the club um, or uh, upon release kind of join up for our newsletter. And then upon release, um, that reserve gets once it goes to the club. We then make an announcement out to the general public, people that are on our mailing list. We're releasing our reserve, and usually within a month from that time, it's gone. Okay, excellent. And so we, Christian is also on, and he is from Chile, and I had the pleasure of interviewing him. He is the winemaker at Vic Winery in Chile. And so we got a little geeky when we talked about the vineyards themselves. And so that's the question he's asking is, what are you looking for in the vineyard? How are you managing those vines? You know, like what direction are the vines and what do we, what do you do to maintain that? Yeah, so all the vines are on uh, VSP, so vertical shoot positioning. Um, the vines are, um, they yield uh, between two and three tons per acre. So not a lot of tonnage per acre um, from that, from this particular vineyard. Um, they're all uh, facing, the, the vines are facing um, east. Um, so kind of southeast. Um, so they get a lot of morning sun and then all of the clusters are turned um, and the shoots are positioned where the afternoon sun um, in Paso. So uh, July, August and September in Paso, the sun is really, really hot. Um, so we get those clusters into the shade. They get a little bit of dilapidated light through um, onto the clusters to kind of keep them, um, keep them from um, keep them from burning, um, keep that uh, sunburn from happening, um, but they get all of the sunlight in the morning um, and early afternoon, because um, one of the things from our Cab Franc perspective, we're not big bell pepper fans. We want a little bit in the wine to let it know that it's Cab Franc. Um, and I know, Laura, you've talked about a number of winemakers at Cab Franc, but might be some new people in line. So um, Cab Franc, um, the pyrazine, the chemical compound in Cab Franc, so I'll get a little chemistry geeky, um, the pyrazines in Cab Franc is what contributes to that bell pepper profile. So it's a sulfur compound that exists within that grape. It exists within that whole family, that whole line, um, all the way to, to its progeny of Cabernet Sauvignon. So the sun actually isn't ripening that breaks that chemical down. It's actually sunlight. Um, so we're looking for a lot of that sunlight on the fruit in the morning, break that chemical down, um, not make it real green bell pepper, not make it in that profile. Um, and then, like I said, the afternoon sun, when it's really, really hot, really, really peaking, all of those clusters are in the shade. 
And then uh, we have another question of how, when did you harvest this season? And um, uh, so I, I think they're from Washington. So, but you're in Paso Robles. So yeah. when did you harvest this season? Was it weird? Was it, and you know, I, I'm assuming because of those heat spikes, was there anything yeah. different that was done? Yeah, so Paso, um, Paso saw a huge heat spike. One, we had a really poor fruit set in, in April and May. Um, so harvest was, was way down this year in Paso, actually way down across most of the state of California. Um, but Paso was probably 40 to 50% down from normal tonnage. Um, that was caused by that, by that poor fruit set. And then we had massive heat spikes in, uh, in September. Um, so that forced grapes to really rise in bricks but not necessarily be ripeness in physiological ripeness. So all of the flavors that are there. Um, so we harvest not only by chemistry, um, but we look at the grape, we look at the, the seeds. So we're looking for brown seeds. Um, we're looking for that brown kind of tannin, not green kind of astringent tannins, looking for, uh, looking for tannin to allow the wine to age. And we also look for, you kind of chew on the fruit as you walk through the vineyard. Um, so you're looking for the flesh of the grape to release from the skin. Um, and you want the skins to be a little bit chewy, but not too chewy. So, you know, you're going to get some color because all of the color is going to come from the skins. Um, so uh, this year, um, we harvested early. We actually harvested the first week of October and that was pushing it. Um, we brought the fruit in, uh, it was about 26.2 bricks, I think, um, across both, uh, both, both variety, both, both clone one and, uh, clone 312. Um, which is a little higher than, you know, we, we typically try to target between 25 and 26, so a little higher than that. Um, and we did a lot of sorting in the winery, so there was a lot of raisins coming in from that heat spike. Um, so you, you listen to a lot of wineries in Paso pull a lot of the raisins out during processing. Um, so a lot of people lost a lot of fruit, not only to poor fruit set, but also because of the raisin profile. And this is a perfect lead-in question. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to figure out how to say this, a caristos. <laughs> is there an open tasting room? They're going to take a pilgrimage with a friend and they love a vineyard that had an old B-17 crash site. And I know what vineyard that is, but what about a tasting room? So actually we're in the process of uh, opening a tasting room right now. Um, we've just finished signing the lease um, and we're getting ready to put up our ABC license actually this weekend. So um, we're probably looking to open that tasting room. It'll be in downtown Paso. Um, so it'll be right down the street from, uh, from Copia and Seashell Cellars and right next to Crazy Woman Cellar. So we're looking to joining the downtown tasting room crowd. Probably be, um, I'm going to guess, late January um, by the time we get everything pulled together. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're really excited to be kind of getting into a tasting room and begin to uh, provide our wines to the general public rather than just through um, social media and I mean we do love tasting in a vineyard we do love tasting um, we do love tasting in other places but um, it's all about uh, I think opening that tasting room will allow us to expand the Cab Franc love throughout the uh, throughout the region and celebrate it and, this great day. <clears throat> okay so we need to talk about the label okay so my first question is tasting room going to be dog friendly tasting room is going to be dog friendly um, dogs will be required to be on leashes um, so it's uh, kind of a requirement, kind of a legal requirement. So dogs will be on leashes at the time. Um, and then we will, of course, reserve the right if dogs come in, they kind of get argumentative with, uh, with our own wine or honor, um, Vegas. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll certainly accept dogs into the tasting room. We look forward to having people bring their dogs into the tasting room. And tell us about the label. Yeah, so um, the label uh, was actually designed. Um, one of the things when we uh, when we started the winery, that's that's Draco, that's on the label. So he was our uh, phenomenal wine runner for for fourteen awesome years, um, and because uh, we're we're kind of scientists by education, um, one of the things we wanted to do was have Draco be kind of in the, the heart and soul of the winery. He was a big part of us growing up, as he was a big part of us, big part of our family. Um, and when he passed at 14, kind of ripped a hole out of our heart. Um, like any, any, any pet owner, um, any dog owner that, that, that's out there, um, dogs become part of the family. Um, so he ripped a hole out of our heart and we, we put a Draco tree in the spot where he used to sleep. So a Draco, a Draco tree, he was named after the, uh, the constellation of all the dragon souls in the sky. He was not named after Draco Malfoy, which some people also think. Um, so when he, uh, like I said, we, we put the Draco tree um, in the spot of him where he, where, when he passed. 
And then when we wanted to start the winery, we wanted to have, like I said, we wanted to have him be part of that, be part of that kind of process. Um, so he, uh, we, we kind of did some research, kind of kicked some things around. And um, the genus name or the Latin name of a Draco tree is Dracaena. Um, so it's phonetically, phonetically pronounced on the back of the label um, to help people out because a lot of people don't uh, struggle to pronunciation. Um, so it, it was really great from the standpoint of incorporating him. If you look at the back of the label, the, the gray part that's there behind him on that, on that label. Um, so that is a Dracaena tree. Um, so it's kind of a gnarly, uh, a gnarly looking bark tree. Um, looks kind of very old. It's, uh, it's based in the Canary Islands, which is where it originates. Um, so there's a Dracaena Draco. Um, and that's kind of the, it's still in the spot where he used to, well, it's not in the spot where he used to sleep because we've moved, um, but we still have that Dracaena Draco. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really a memorial to Draco and, uh, and the winery is a, uh, kind of a memorial to him. And so why, why Cab Franc? Why did Dracaena Wines choose to make Cab Franc the spotlight? Yeah, so um, I, I, I still remember to this day um, we were in, uh, we were actually up in Napa, um, when we were, uh, originally getting into wine and, and looking to, uh, to kind of experience, um, the wine, the wine phenomena. Um, we used to kind of have date nights, um, at home. Um, and we would, we would start by, um, uh, buying, buying wine in your local wine shop across the bottom of the shelf, somewhere between five and six dollars. Um, and then we slowly, as we progressed in our career, uh, we would begin moving up um, the ladder within the, within the, within the wine community, within the wine um, stores. And as anybody would do in, in the United States, when you want to experience more about wine, um, you in turn go up to, uh, you go to Napa Sonoma, right? So um, that's what we did. Um, so we went to, to Napa, we, we were tasting, uh, tasting in Napa, um, and we happened to pull into um, a winery on the Silverado Trail. Um, so William Harrison. Um, just out of the blue, pulled in, wanted to kind of taste some wine. Um, it was back, I think it was in 1993, believe it or not. I think it was around that time, 93, 94. Um, and tasting through the wines, um, some, some interesting things that were there. Um, talking to the, you know, a lot of it is the experience in a tasting room. Um, and we, in turn, talking to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the person pouring the wines. And she happened to just have a club member come in. Um, so she happened to have a, a special wine open and she asked if we would try it. So we said, sure. Um, so poured the wine, poured it, poured it blindly. Um, and we, we kind of fell in love. It was, it was phenomenal. We, we just, we could still describe it today with all of the, the dark fruit that's in there. A lot of the cigar box, a lot of tobacco, great, smooth, silky tannins. Um, and we were just, we had never tasted anything like this before. She spun the bottle around and it was Cat Franc. And we had no idea that at that time was a, was a 1991 William Harrison Cab Franc. Um, never heard of Cab Franc before. And from that point on, we kind of went on, a, went on a, uh, a mission to find Cab Francs across the state of California and, and across the world. So we've tasted wines from um, South America. We've had Cab Francs from the Loire. We've had Cab Francs from Hungary. Um, and they're all very different. Um, but then when we wanted to start the winery, we wanted to be different. We didn't want to do another Syrah. We didn't want to do another Zin um, and um, take a step back there. So um, Napa Sonoma, Napa Sonoma, um, we decided to kind of take a trip, um, fly into San Francisco and fly out of LA and just drive the PCH, right? Like, so if you're based on the East Coast and all of a sudden you decide to go to the West Coast, you got to drive the, uh, got to drive the coast of California. So we stopped in this place called Paso, um, which is dead in the middle between LA and San Francisco, about three hours due west or due, or sorry, due south or due north of there. Um, and said, hey, there's wine here, let's, let's check this out. Um, so we actually spent quite a long time in Paso um, tasting wines. Um, and when then we kind of said, this is where we wanna be when, when we wanted to start a winery. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll ask that question a bit, how do we get started in winemaking? Um, but we fell in love with Paso. It was such a pay it forward community um, of just learning from everybody. Um, and that was one of the things we loved about Paso. And so let's go back to this 2018 Cab Franc. Um, you had said it's 90% Cab Franc, five Cab Sauv, three uh, Malbec and two Petit Verdot. Uh, what, why did you create that blend? And like for me, I'm getting nice, I'm getting nice red fruit. It's actually a mixture of red fruit and dark fruit, but it's got the licorice, it's got graphite in it. 
And something that I love in Kevron is that floral, that violet um, aromatics. So why was that the blend? And what do you get out of it? Because as I say all the time, everybody's palate is different. So what do you get? Yeah. Um, so um, that blend, um, it was essentially put together. I mean, um, I, re I remember putting this every year when we blend, it's always fun, especially for the classic. Um, we've got uh, all the wines that we can possibly put together. Um, so we always start, like I said, we always start with that reserve. Um, and then once we make that reserve, then we've kind of got whatever barrels we've got left. Um, so we taste all of those barrels, begin to put those barrels together as a Cab Franc wine. Um, and then we begin to blend in other varietals um, to see what enhances the profile, whether it's color, whether it's body. Um, we always want to do things that are a, um, a we want to push it away from our, our reserve, um, but we still want to keep it in the classic format of um, a Cab Franc. Um, so it, it's really about what makes the wine different, what makes the wine really special. Um, so we continue to kind of blend varietals in um, based upon the percentage that we can get our hands on. Um, as a, as a small winery under 400 cases, it's hard to, hard to find a lot of volume of wine that'll help blend it off. Um, so it's really, for us, it's all about one, what, what's gonna make the wine better. Um, and uh, this, that, was the, that was the blend that happened to work. I can hear Vegas shaking. <laughs> yes, Vegas, Vegas is with me. Vegas, Vegas, Vegas so, is the second warmer. <laughs> What um what do you think is special about Cab Franc? Like what what is so incredible about this grape variety? One of the things that, that I and we talked about it yesterday on the uh on on the Cab Franc event um with all of the winemakers, which was really, really fun. Thank you for hosting that. Um that was that was a, that was a great time. Um just wish I could have had more wine with it. Um <laughs> What to me, what makes what makes wine, what makes Cab Franc really exciting is its um, is its soft profile. It's kind of really silky. Um, it goes with all kinds of different foods. Um, you can have it both on its own, um, or you can have it with all kinds of different foods. Um, it takes on the life of the vineyard um, that's there. It really allows the the vineyard to shine through. So wherever you're sourcing Cab Franc from, um, it, it's really um, the winemaker can do a little bit with it, but it's really made in the vineyard and the quality of the fruit coming out of the vineyard. Um, so some of the things, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really great. It really, it, Cap Trunk really takes on, um, like I said, really takes on the, really takes on the soils, um, takes on some of that minerality, um, takes on some of the, 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 the red fruit or the dark fruit profile. Our, our reserve tends to go more dark fruit and less red fruit. The classic tends to go more red fruit and less dark fruit. A um, little bit clone profile, but also a little bit from, a, from the oak perspective. Um, so the oak program on the reserve typically, uh, the new oak program, I should say, um, typically um, is anywhere from um, 30 to 40% new oak, where our classic, uh, so the wine you're tasting here, um, is about 30% 30, um, 30 new oak. Um, and then the rest of it's all neutral barrels. Um, so really, I don't want... Um, the profile that we're looking for is not to let wood shine through, but to let the fruit shine through. Um, so that's some of the things we really love about Cab Franc. And there's so many different ways to make Cab Franc. Um, it's not a big jammy in your face um, kind of wine. It's more of a um, more of a kind of silky elegance. I think I used the term yesterday. Um, it can be both that little black dress that you want to take out on a, on a Saturday night and, and go out on the town, or it could be sitting at home in a, in a big warm, um, big warm blanket with sweatpants sitting around a fire um, and getting cozy with it. So um, it can be both of those wines, um, which is really great. And so tomorrow is actually Cab Franc Day and right. Dracina Wines is doing something special. So what, what are you doing tomorrow for Cab Franc Day? Yeah, so tomorrow we're actually um, doing a, a great tasting. Um, LXV put together a, a great tasting in Paso. So I believe there's gonna be 10 winemakers um, from Paso Robles pouring their particular Cab Franc. Um, so it's going to be at the, uh, if you happen to be in Paso tomorrow, it's going to be at the Casa Event Center. Um, so come out. Um, it'll be uh, 10 different wineries in Paso making Cab Franc um, being, and, and pouring their own Cab Franc. So we will actually be pouring our 2019 Cab Franc um, in, the, in that event tomorrow. So not necessarily the 18, but we're going to be pouring the 2019 Cab Franc tomorrow. So um, if you happen to be in the region or somewhere nearby, 
stop on by and you can try 10 different varieties of Cab Franc um, from 10 different producers. And there's also, um, the, if you go to Cab Franc Day, Paso Robles, something like that, um, there are tickets available and there's actually also going to be a master class and a, you know, a, a seminar and the grand tasting. So it is this big thing because Paso has um, a love for Cab Franc and they're actually is, you know, quite a bit of Cab Franc uh, starting to pop up in, in Paso Robles. And um, I think that you had said something about the people of Paso are so, um, you know, pay it forward, you know, the rising tide raises all ships type thing. But what do you think about like Cab Franc winemakers and how they interact with each other? Yeah, we're we're definitely a unique breed, um, so uh, it's funny because just like on the uh, just like on the tasting from from you know I'll I'll take it back to the very first vintage we had in 2013. Um, we uh, we were sourcing from the same vineyard as Dark Star Cellars, um, and I think his name was Norm who was there. Um, so um, was it Norm or Mike? I, Mike, I think I think Mike. So, so, so long ago. Um, and we kind of went in and we found out he was sourcing fruit from that same vineyard. Um, and we went in and asked to, asked to talk to him. He actually happened to be out in the winery. Um, he came out and spoke to us for three hours, sitting around um, drinking a, a bottle of his Cab Franc, um, sitting around his tapes room, just talking about Cab Franc um, and learning all the things. So he wasn't worried about us competing with him. He wasn't worried about us making another wine um, and stealing his customers. Um, it was really all about learning and making Paso a better wine community and making Cab Franc a better wine. Um, so it was, you know, it was, I think you kind of led in with uh, what makes Cab Franc producers unique. Um, everybody has their own style of Cab Franc they're going to make. Um, and it, it's really great from a, from a public perspective of they can try all of these Cab Francs. Like tomorrow, you're going to be able to taste 10 different styles of Cab Franc all grown throughout the Paso Robles wine region. Um, so it'll be really be, I'm, I'm real, not only am I looking forward to interacting with the, with the uh, consumers that'll be there, but also interacting with all the winemakers and having all of those cats from side by side and just learning from it, not only uh, sharing, but also learning from everybody else of um, what we can do to not, uh, just, just to be better. What can we do to make a better wine? And then we have another question about um, your use of um, neutral oak. Why, why do you use neutral oak? Have you ever used retoasted barrels or would you ever think of using sherry, old sherry barrels? Um, never thought about using sherry, um, kind of like bourbon barrels. Um, I do have an affinity also for beer. Um, not only when, when, I'm, not, when I'm not drinking wine, I'm, uh, I'm drinking beer, I'm uh, drinking IPAs or I'm drinking stouts. Um, two, two, two very different wine profiles, two very different beer profiles. Um, but the... Uh, one of the things that, that barrels, um, one, I'm, one, I don't want a lot of new oak. Um, I don't want that profile in, in our wines. Um, but neutral barrels essentially allow the wine to kind of, what I would say, cut off the, the harshness of tannins. So as the wines age through that overall process, um, the barrels contribute and allow the, the, the tannins to interact with the oak that's there without contributing the flavors of the oak. Um, so that's typically why we like to use neutral oak barrels. Um, and actually, we start with uh, one-year-old um, white oak barrels. Um, so the white wine, so uh, say a Chardonnay barrel, um, where the Chardonnay has absorbed all of the flavors of the barrel, um, but the barrel's still there. It still doesn't have that saturation from the red wine. Um, then we begin to use that barrels in a red wine. Um, and then from our new oak program, those new oak barrels kind of come in and they begin to cycle through the process. So we've got barrels and ranging anywhere from this year having um, having a couple of new oak barrels all the way to having barrels that are um, that were part of actually our 2016 vintage. Um, so we just kind of keep cycling through them. And as we begin to add barrels into the program, new barrels or used barrels, um, it, it's really all about cutting the, 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 the harshness of a tannin, um, of a red wine tannin um, out of the wine, but then also with the new oak contributing a little bit of that new oak toastiness profile. I have not done, um, I think one of the questions that was asked of, um, 
doing uh, retoasted barrels, so I've not done retoasted barrels because I really don't want a lot. Like I said, I don't want a lot of that toast profile in there. So I really, that's why I really like the, the neutral profile of barrels. And what do you think is kind of the biggest issue with Cab Franc being an underdog? Why, why does it kind of get stuck behind its progeny? Um, I think there's a couple of different things. Um, one, um, I think one, because it's got the same name as Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and when people, people don't pronounce wines, they, they come in and they ask for a Chard. They don't ask for a Chardonnay. They come in and they ask for a Cab. They don't come in and ask for a Cab Franc. They come in and ask for a Cab. So naturally people go to Cabernet Sauvignon. They don't separate to a part. So um, I, blame the, uh, the, I blame the individual that named Cab Franc um, rather than calling it the, uh, um, a Savignon Franc. Um, they decided to call it a Cabernet Franc um, just because of that, that, that blend of Sauvignon Blanc and uh, Cabernet Franc that made Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so that would, have been, that would have been great having a slightly different name profile. But I also think there's, there's just not a lot of Cab Franc that's out there. People don't know it. Um, and when people do find it um, and you find Cab Franc fans, um, as, as, as in Cab Franc Day, um, when you find Cab Franc fans, they're really – they're just excited about it and they love the wine. They love what the wine can say. Um, you don't necessarily hear people talk about Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, even in France, you kind of got, um, you got the left bank and the right bank. Um, and it's always the, it's always the Cabernet Sauvignon user. Um, and typically old Cab Franc is always being blended. You don't see it a lot of times being, uh, being added as, as an individual varietal or using other varietals to make Cab Franc better. It's always using Cab Franc to make the other varietals better. Um, and I think that's turning. Um, I think Cab Franc Day, um, when, I, when I think about when we started in 2013, um, there was a handful of people out there that you could find making Cab Franc. Um, and it's now, it now grown, um, which has been great. And so if, if somebody comes to Josina Wines and says, you know, oh, I'll have your cab. How do you react? What do you say? Mm -hmm. How do you educate them? Yeah, so that's a that's a, a great point. Every every time we pour at events, um, somebody comes up and reads our label and say, "I'll try the cab." I'm saying, "Well, we don't we don't have a cab, but we do have a cab front. Would you like to try that?" Um, so it might be a little might might be a little harsh, but um, and then say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I meant." Um, so you pour them a cab front and you kind of say, hey, do, "Do you know Do you know about cab front? Do you know Do you know what it is? Do you know its history?" Um, and usually you kind of look at that you kind of look at that uh, you look at the person and you say. Like, hmm. No, I don't know. And then you kind of go into the story. Um, you know, how does the uh, how, did, how did Cabernet Sauvignon come into being? Um, it wouldn't have existed without um, without its father, Cabernet Cabernet Franc. Um, so it, it's really all about that story. And then people begin to explore it. Um, it's not a big heavy tannic wine. It's not a big oaky wine. Um, I don't think um, personally um, my particular palate. I don't think it pairs um, great with a lot of big heavy oak. I think it overwhelms the fruit. Um, there are some wineries that do a lot, do a lot of do a lot of oak. Um, it's just not my particular style. It, it's different people's styles of winemaking. Um, but the wines that I like to make, the wines that um, I like to enjoy, um, are not a lot of heavy oakness. Um, so I want the I want really want the fruit to shine through. And so, like I I always tell the story of the you know one wild, windy, crazy evening in the vineyard. You know, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc found each other. It was love in the air, and it came through with Cabernet Sauvignon. And and then after that, everybody forgot about the parent. <laughs> everybody forgot about the parent. That was it. The kid came yep. into the spotlight, and that was it. And it's actually kind of sad because Cab Franc has, has been busy in the vineyard. And has been very busy in the vineyard. It is one of the parents of Merlot. It is one of the parents of Carmen Air. And so in Bordeaux, you know, you have, you know, Cab Sauve and Merlot and you hear these terms and none of these would be there if it wasn't for Cab Franc, yet Cab Franc there is only a blending grape. And we need to, you know, that's, that's you know, the hashtag of Cab Franc Day is more than a blending grape. And I, I just think what, what would you like Cab Franc Day to expand to in, in the future? How do you think that Cab Franc Day can come in and help 
understand. We're seeing people saying that they're seeing more, cat, you know, varietal Cab Francs. And, you know, what does Cab Franc have to do to start showing more? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, when you think about parents and children, right? Parents always want their children to do better than them. You always want to kind of keep generationally moving forward. Um, so Cab Franc did did that, right? It made all of its progeny better than what it was. Um, but also the parents need to take the spotlight a little bit. Um, I think Cab Franc Day has enlightened people. I mean, you think about all of the, every, every variety, at least that I know of, has, a, has their own special day. Merlot has their own month. Um, maybe we could make a Cab Franc, maybe uh, all the winemakers get together and make a Cab Franc movie like Sideways and and, <laughs> and push <laughs> Cab Sauv out of the <laughs> way, put, put say bad things. <laughs> Um, so that could be an interesting concept, but, uh, I think Cap Franc Day is really all about getting the word out, right? It's, it's kind of advertising. Um, it's making itself known to, um, the general public. Um, I think you'll start to see more Cab Francs in on, I think you're seeing it on wine lists. You're not only seeing it on fine wine lists. Um, we distribute our Cab Franc to a couple of different restaurants in, the, um, in California, um, but not very many. We are not in mainstream channels. We are not through the, the three tier distribution network. Um, so it's really just kind of continuing to push Cab Franc as a varietal um, in front of, front of customers, um, in front of consumers. Um, I think keeping um, where you can, keeping the price point down to allow people to explore it. Um, so um, I, I, I really just think, I think Cab Franc Day is, is great at pushing it out there. When, when I think back to, to when, how Cab Franc Day started and where it is today, it's extremely, it, it's grown phenomenally. Um, and I just, just kind of see it hitting the, the bottom of the exponential curve and kind of starting to go up logarithmically as, as more and more people um, begin to taste Cab Francs, find Cab Francs that they like, um, and just continue to support those wineries through purchases of Cab Franc. And so how can somebody support Dracina Wines? Um, great question. Um, so we sell our wines through our website. Um, so you can go to dracinawines.com, um, depending what state you're in. Um, we ship to, I think it's 40 states now. Um, so you can purchase our um, our Cab Francs through there. Uh, we also make a Chenin Blanc and a Rosé. Um, so we kind of stay in that Loire region. Um, but uh, as we're talking about Cab Franc, um, so you can buy all of that through there um, and we'll, uh, we'll get it out to you. Ship it. It's, we're getting pretty close to that winter weather where um, things will, will, will stop shipping. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, you can get our Cab Francs through our website, um, visit a couple of restaurants in, in the Fresno area um, or in Paso. Um, and then, uh, like I said, probably look for us to open that tasting room in, uh, in January in downtown Paso. And they can find you at dracinawines.com. There's, you already mentioned about the newsletter so that they can, um, sign up and be aware of the release. Um, yeah, somebody did ask about the release uh, of the, of the reserve Cap Franc. And yeah. I know you... Jersina Wines lost their fruit in 2020. So you want to just talk about that a little bit and how you pivoted from there? Sure. Um, pivot. Yeah. The, the wonderful word of, of COVID. Um, so in 2020, um, we actually lost our fruit to, to smoke. We had a fire um, just on the other side of Plumber Vineyard. 2020 in California, just it would, it's like the whole state was on fire. If anybody remembers back to that time. Um, so we did a um, smoke the, the taint from smoke, um, and granted you can get smoke from a barrel, um, but the taint from smoke, which is kind of a negative attribute, think about, um, think about licking an ashtray to kind of give you that profile, um, which, which is not exactly, that's most of the face you get when somebody would taste it. Um, the, the ability to taste that reaches a threshold level and it becomes overwhelming. So really, really low levels. Um, most consumers cannot taste, some super tasters can pick it up, but most consumers cannot taste, it's kind of like Brett um, so the, the off profile of Brett that might come into some wines, um, Brett kind of famous for, for sour beers. Um, so from, uh, we did a, we did a micro ferment in the vineyard. Um, we didn't really pick up any smoke. Um, so micro ferment essentially is, um, pulling some bunches off the vines, fermenting them through the process and then tasting the juice. Um, and then you'll either pick up the smoke or you won't pick up the smoke profile. So, um, early on in the vineyard, um, we weren't poking any up picking up any smoke profile in that 2020. And then as we got closer to harvest and we did another micro ferment, um, we began to get really, really high levels of smoke 
um, had it out, had it analyzed. Um, so Joe sent it out to be analyzed, um, and it was well above the threshold levels that that most consumers would pick up. Um, so Joe was great to us. Um, he allowed us to essentially um, not pick that fruit that year. Um, knowing knowing that that happened, what we did is we held back our 2019. Um, and our 2009, we held back a portion of that 2019, um, put blended it off into, into barrel, um, put it back into barrel. So it's an extended aged cab trunk. Um, and then it was very little, it was very, very tiny, tiny quantities of wine um, that we had that we had left over. Um, so we wound up um, looking for some other fruit to blend in, looking for some other juice to blend in. Um, we wound up finding some um, Merlot to incorporate into there. So um, into that 2019 wine, um, we put in um, 2021 Merlot. Um, so we didn't want to do a Cab Franc. We didn't want to do something um, the same um, against our own, against our own, call it classic Cab Franc or our reserve Cab Franc. Um, but we wound up blending in 21% Merlot um, from 2021. So it's still a Cab Franc um, by design. Um, but because it's more than 5% of a particular vi uh, vintage, um, we couldn't call it a, um, a vintage wine. Um, so we actually called it a red wine. We didn't, uh, and uh, we actually sent out, um, we did a grant a contest with our um, wine club. Um, so one of our, we asked them to, all of them to design labels um, to recognize what the vintage was about. Um, had to be TTB compliant, of course. Um, we didn't want to and turn around and file a, a label that would be um, non-TTB compliant. Um, one of our club members, we, um, we picked three different labels um, that we thought we really liked um, and then put it out to our mailing list and our mailing list voted and we wound up launching Phoenix um, in this past year. Um, so Phoenix, like I said, is a blend of 2019 Cab Franc um, along with 2021 Merlot. Okay. And that is available now? Correct. That is available now. So it was distributed to our wine club. Um, and then there's a, there's a small portion of that left. Uh, we'll actually be getting ready to blend our 2021 um, Cabernet Franc probably in the next two to three weeks and look to bottle that um, in the early part of 2023. Okay. And so typically your reserve is released on Cab Franc Day. Uh, to the general public, the the club members get it earlier, but that gets released. The the classic gets released in October, and Correct. then your reserve gets released in um, dis on December fourth. But there is no reserve for twenty twenty. Correct. Correct. There's no reserve for twenty the twenty twenty two Cab Franc Day. There's no reserve, um, but we will. Uh, the plan will be to, of course, have our reserve on twenty twenty three Cab Franc Day. So um, one year from tomorrow we will be releasing our reserve 2021 to the general public. All right. And so again, other than the website, people can find you all over social media. You're Dracina Wines, like everywhere, right? Yep. Correct. Correct. Great, uh, great chief marketing officer um, pushing the, uh, pushing the wine out there. Um, so it's uh, uh, that, that's really how we grew. We grew from word of mouth. Um, we grew from um, pouring wines at various events um, and it's great to have a, uh, um, it's great to have that general public pushing us, Google reviews, um, all of those kind of things. It's, uh, it's really great. And as, as well as other wineries, right? Um, uh, other wineries that, that we talk to um, when consumers go in and ask for, do you, you know, we're looking for Cab Franc, who do you recommend? Um, we're, we're, we're top one, top two, top three um, words, uh, wineries out of their mouth, which is great. So, um, Acastero, however, <laughs> Acastos is saying he just wanted a very quick overview. How do you go from um, not ever hearing of Cab Franc to now we have multiple Cab Francs and a reserve Cab Franc? So you you did also go to your background in science. Tell us where your background is in science. And then you did also attend UC Davis. Yeah. But um, how did you what, what is your actual science background? So my, um, my educational background, I have a, a bachelor's and a master's in food science. Um, so I'm that crazy guy that uh, puts the ingredient statement on the back of the back of every package. I put all those ingredients together to um, make it taste good and make sure it's safe um, for consumers to, to, to have. Um, so strong background in chemistry. It's about 60% chemistry, 20% biology, 20% physics. Um, so that's the background there. And then went to UC Davis um, to get my enology degree. 
Um, so that really gave me the foundation. Chemistry gave me the foundation to become um, winemaking. Um, and then it's all about going out and trying different wines um, to in turn hone your palate. Um, so being a food scientist really has to, you have to have a honed palate, have to have a, a honed sense of smell and taste. Um, that allowed me to kind of move into winemaking. Um, and then what was the other question you asked? I forgot. Uh, well, I guess I when you first started, wine. yeah, it's right there. So how do you go to the, how do you become the, I guess, like the expert of Cap Franc? <laughs> yeah. So like in, in 2013, um, did that, did that classic. Um, and then I think it was in 2015, um, we did our first reserve, um, which was about really wanting, um, the classic can be anywhere from a hundred percent Cab Franc to, um, I think 90% was the, was the lowest we've ever been from a Cab Franc perspective. Um, so it's really about making, um, the, always the plan around the reserve was to have a vineyard designated wine. So it's about being 100% Cab Franc. It's essentially like, I, I think I mentioned earlier, dirt in a glass um, or dirt in a bottle. So it's everything that the vineyard can give to me as the winemaker and then crafting that vineyard into a bottle of wine. So that's what the reserve is all about. Um, and then the classic kind of is, is always that classic Cabernet Franc, whether it's 100% Cabernet Franc or it's a blend of other varietals with Cabernet Franc. Um, it's... Uh, and, and then, of course, Phoenix coming on. So we'll probably continue to run with Phoenix. Um, customers have really kind of, uh, our, our wine club and customers have had a, a positive reaction to it. So we think we're going to kind of continue that going forward as we continue to grow, um, grow, grow the winery and, uh, and, and grow, to, grow to the public as we move into this tasting room profile. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you for coming on and sharing Dracena Wines and uh, the 2018 Classic Cab Franc, and I saved a little um, so that I can raise the glass with you and say slancha. Slancha. Thank you for doing all this, Lori. Appreciate it. And a happy Cab Franc day. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Akastos. <laughs>